Hello and welcome to Code Slicing. In this episode, we are going to be animating the points themselves. So we've created the complex shapes that we want. We, I mean, we can do that, no problem. Uh, but now we're going to animate the actual points on the path. So we're going to change one shape into another shape. And it's actually pretty easy to do. I think you're going to like it. So let's get into it right now. So what we're looking at is the arrow we created in the first episode of this series. And we want to animate it so it's pointing to the left. Now, the way we're going to do that, we're not going to animate the shape itself. We're going to animate the points in the shape. There are two aspects to this. The first thing is which points do we want to animate to? And the second part is how does the animation actually work? And we'll get to both of these things and we're going to start with the points themselves. Now, before we continue, I'm going to introduce you to a lovely extension within Pure Swift UI, which hides a lot of complexity for such a small extension. And it is the two extension. And what that allows you to do is interpolate between two points and you just tell it how far along you want it to go. That's very useful in situations where you want to animate points, for example, like we do here. I'm going to show you very briefly how that extension works. So let's just comment uh, all of this out. And I'm going to use another extension to draw an ellipse. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to define our point. So we've got a point, which is, say, the G top leading point of that layout guide. Now bear in mind, that is just a CG point. That's all, what's all the points in layout guides are. They are all just points. They're not tied to that grid in any way other than how they are generated. After that, they are literally just points you can do anything with and they behave in the same way and they have the same extensions. In this case, the two extension. But before we get to that, I'm going to say path ellipse. I'm going to give it the origin point and I'm going to use square of 10 and then I'm going to change the anchor point to be the center. Okay, now we've got our ellipse that is showing us where that point is at the top left of that layout guide. So if I want to interpolate that between the top left and the bottom right, I would use the two extension. I would do it like this. I would say two g dot bottom trailing. And then you give it a factor and that factor is how far along that path you want to go. So if I give it zero, nothing will change because I'm saying move from the first point to the second point, zero amount. However, if I change it to one, it goes all the way there. So we're now at the other end of that interpolation. If I go to 0 0.5, we're halfway along and so on and so on. Let's go back to where we were. What we're going to do is we're going to actually add another shoulder to this layout guide because when the arrow is pointing left, we want there to be another shoulder there for that head pointing in that direction. And what we need then is we need a shoulder ratio, which is actually one minus the shoulder ratio. So we can define it like this. We can say one minus shoulder ratio like that. So if I resume that, we should see our new shoulder. But the arrows changed as well. Actually looks pretty nice. I like that arrow, but we are using a coordinate of one to define the shoulder. Whereas now things have changed. Now we've got four columns in our grid. So we need to go to this second one. And we do that very easily like this. So now, now we've got our original arrow. Lovely. The sharp eyed among you will notice that I've actually added another point that was not there in the original arrow. That point lies right here between what used to be the last point and the start of the path. Okay, so there's another point right there, which allows us to mirror the behavior for when it's pointing to the right. Because when this 
is orientated to the left. I want there to be another point, which will be the tip of the arrow. And then this point will actually be here, giving us the top edge of the head of the arrow pointing in the other direction. So the trailing and leading points are not going to move. The others, on the other hand, are going to move. So we need to account for that. So we're going to replace all of these or add to it. We're going to say two. We'll give it a G. And we're going to also give it a factor that doesn't yet exist. And that's fine because we can just add one. So before we actually add all the animatable stuff, we'll put a placeholder in for the factor and we'll call it factor like that. And then we'll take these values and we'll take these ones and now we have something that compiles. So when we change these points, we should see the result. So as I said, this first point here, we want that to be there after the animation, which is one comma zero. So we're sort of flipping these around. Oh, there. There it is at the top. And now we want to move this point over to here, which is one comma one. And we want this point to go down to mirror what it was doing over here. So we want the one at two comma zero to now be three comma one. Three comma one. The next one, which is two comma three, right down here, we want that to be three comma two. This point, which is two comma two, we want it to be one comma two. And then the final point, which is zero comma two, we want it to be one comma three. One comma three. Excellent. So now we've got our arrow pointing in the other direction. And because it's got a factor of one in there, it's at the end of the animation. If I change that back to zero, it's at the beginning of the animation. The arrow is pointing right. If I go to point five, it's halfway between. It's like this morphed, halfway morphed shape. And this is what is going to make our users think we are amazing because they'll be like, wow, I love that. I love how they did that. This is amazing. This is one of the most fantastic animations I've ever seen in my life. They might think that. So let's set it back to one. And we now need to talk about animatable shapes. Well, the fortunate thing for us is that shape is animatable. It does adhere to the animatable protocol, which defines an animatable data property of type vector arithmetic. That's quite a mouthful, but it just means that SwiftUI knows how to deal with these types when it's talking about animating things. I'll go into some more detail in a minute. Right, so we say animatable data and we replace that with double. And double is one of the very few types in Swift UI that does implement vector arithmetic at this time. I'm sure there'll be more very soon, but that means we can use it for this no problem at all. We need a getter and we need a setter and we need something to use for it, which can be a private variable that backs this. And we're going to use a private var of factor of type double and in the getter we just return factor and in the setter we say factor equals new value. So how does this work? Well whenever you animate a change in state in such a way that the animatable data property returns a different value from where it started then SwiftUI will interpolate between the start and end values it will interpolate that according to the timing curve that has been associated with the animation and it will modify animatable data with those values. And that's what generates the animation itself. So we only have to worry about the end state of an animation 
and the framework will supply the intermediate values to us. So we can use all the values of factor that SwiftUI gives to us, even though we're only supplying the final value. Factor is going to be interpolated from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, depending on the direction we're going. So we can just draw our path using that value because this is all going to be handled for us. Now, I know that that is quite complex to keep in your head or to understand if, you, if you're new to this. Uh, so I do recommend checking out SwiftUI Labs series on animation because it really is fantastic and well worth a read. Wholeheartedly recommend it. I will leave a link in the description below. But we don't want to be actually supplying ones or zeros. It's not a very declarative way of working. We want to be telling it whether or not it's pointing right, as in we want to drive this with a Boolean. And we can do that like this. So we can actually, in the initializer, say pointing right, which is a Boolean. We'll set it to true by default. And then we say that the factor is equal to pointing right, yes, then we haven't moved because that's our original shape. No, then we've moved all the way. So we don't have to worry about those numbers. All we tell it is whether we're pointing right or not. So we can get rid of this now. And we now, believe it or not, we have a shape that is going to animate from the right to the left. We just have to tell it whether or not it's pointing right or pointing left inside an animation block. So let's put a state variable here called pointing right, pointing right, and that is equal to true. And we're going to add another arrow above this one, which is the one we're going to be animating. And we'll fill it and it will look like the thing we're actually going to be using. So we'll fill it with black. And if I resume, so we can just see that. All right, there we are. And now we're going to actually tell it whether it's pointing right or not. So we say pointing right is pointing right. But of course, it's not going to do anything yet. We need to tell it to change that value. And we can do that in a tap gesture. On tap gesture, self pointing right. What weren't you? Let's toggle it. OK, if I resume this and I play, we are changing that value. So what we should see is it's going to point to the left, but without an animation. There we are. OK, so it's working. We just now have to put this in an animation block. So we say with animation, Ease in out. And then we put that in the actual animation block like that. I have to restart that. There we are. Look at that. We've got our morphing shape. It's doing exactly what it says on the tin. There isn't a tin, but you get the idea. And if we really slow it down, we can see exactly what's going on in this animation. Look at that. Nice. Very nice. And since this technique works for any point, this means, of course, that it also works for control points. So if we look at a slightly more complex example, like the heart we created before, we can see it in action. Now, the only change I've made to get this working is that I've doubled the resolution of the grid and modified the coordinates appropriately. The reason I added more columns and rows to the grid is that I wanted to make it look like it was really beating, like it was really filling with blood and reacting to it. So I'm changing the shape of the bulge as it expands. And to do that, I needed to be more precise with the specific locations of the control points because of what this bloke said in the last episode. It's only when the control points and the point form a straight line that you will get a continuous curve, which makes sense because they're both tangents to each of their curves. It doesn't even matter what angle that line is on. As long as it's straight, you will get a continuous curve. 
Well, you heard what he said. Knows what he's talking about, that dude. If we want to have a continuous curve, we need to keep the line that the control points make going through the point straight. And since it's a linear interpolation, as long as the beginning and end state meet that condition, all intermediate states will conform to that as well. On a side note, I found that a good beating heart needs to be a one-sided easing in the animation. If we do an ease in out, it just won't look as good as it could. It won't have that little bit of a frantic nature to it. And you can see that when we speed it up like this. There we are, lovely. And very easy to do. I mean, once you've got your head around the animatable stuff, imagine the things you can come up with, what you can transform into something else. You know, what the world's your oyster here. So I hope this has inspired you to create something wonderful. So we've covered quite a lot of ground now. We, what have we done? We've done um, grid layouts, polar layouts. We can create complex shapes with Bezier curves. And now we can animate the points that make up those shapes. And in the next episode, we're going to be animating the layout guides themselves, uh, which opens up a world of possibilities. It really is quite incredible. So join me for that. It's going to be brilliant. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them below. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. See you next time.